Good morning everyone. Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church English Online Service. We are so excited to have you join us this morning because we have a great program lineup that is sure to bless and encourage you. If you are joining us for the first time, thank you so much for joining us today and we would like to connect with you through our Emmanuel Baptist Church Connect form after the service so we can know you a little bit better. Now, Let's come into a time of praise and worship and let's magnify and lift the name of Jesus. Over to you, Dr. Samuel.
lost liberty Your love has taken chains of me The sun sets free, is free is he When the sun sets free, has liberty Your love has taken chains of me the sun sets as free as free as the sun sets free as liberty. Your love has taken chains of me. Come on and say, Oh, praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. For you are good. You are good forever. We will dance and sing. Try to hide you and steal you away. They try to keep you inside of the grave. The enemy fought you, he tried, but you lost. You cannot. When we cried for freedom, He told us Jesus has triumphed over the grave. 
This is how I fight my battles 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 I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I find my life. This is how I fight my battles. 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 Surrounded by you, and you look like I'm 
is more than just singing songs. It's more than just coming to church on a Sunday or tuning into an online service. And, oh, that's my quota done for the week. You know, it's more than that. Worship is a, a life that is completely surrendered to God. You know, Romans 12 verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies. And in the Amplified Bible, it says, to dedicate all of yourself set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your rational and um, it's reasonable and logical act of worship. You know, worship is our response to God. The verse starts with the word therefore, and this therefore is following the previous chapters. You know, Romans 8 says that there is now no, con no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
And if God is for us, who can be against us? Neither height nor depth, neither death nor life, nothing can separate us from the love of God. I mean, having heard all of this, what is the only reasonable response? Knowing that Christ died for us and paid it all for us. You know, the only logical response is to offer ourselves and everything of ourselves as a living sacrifice. You know, God wants and demands our everything. And Jesus said to, you know, take up your cross daily and follow Him. He didn't say, you know, just walk along the sidelines and drop in once a week. <laughs> you know, He deserves your everything. But you know, but you know, we get busy and we get distracted by things around us. We get distracted by life and we can be discouraged and disillusioned by the things around us and the things that are happening in the world right now. And sometimes it's hard to live a life that is completely surrendered. You know, can I really honestly say, you know, and my heart will follow wholly after you. you know, I don't know myself. But you know, let me encourage you and you know, I'm encouraging myself as well that there is grace and there is mercy. And you know, I mean, Romans 12 verse 1 says, By the mercies of God, to present your bodies. And you know, knowing that we are, we are not perfect people at all. You know, we will never be good enough and we will never hit the mark. But you know, that's the whole point of what Jesus has done for us. And there is always mercy. You know, God knows where you're at in your life. And he knows where you are in your walk with Him and He knows and He knows and He loves you despite knowing you know no matter what you've done or what you haven't done you know there's no condemnation but at the same time He wants you He wants me and He deserves all of ourselves you know so let us respond to Him today let us sing to Him
Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. A very warm welcome to EBC Sunday service online. I trust you and your family are doing well and in good health. I know that this is a very difficult season for many of us. And it is very important that we look to the Lord and to His promises. Let me read to you a passage of scriptures from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. It said, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This passage holds a, a very special meaning, I believe, for us in this challenging season. It exhorts us, the writer of Hebrews exhorts us to hold fast to the confession of our hope. Who is our hope? It is not something in our mind, but the hope is in the person, our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is so important that we mustn't lose hope because he said, he who promised is faithful. God is faithful. He will see us through. So let us hold on to this hope and look to him. And he says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Stir up, meaning that we are to, uh, you know, encourage to uh, speak to one another, to say, come on. And to uh, not only with words, but with action. Uh, how to love one another, how to care, and also good works. You see, in the midst of this crisis that we are in, Though it is challenging and dark times, but yet in the midst of this, the Lord has opened different doors of opportunity for us to show love, concern, and to do good works. And he says also, not neglecting meeting together is the habit of some. Yes, it is important that we stay connected. Family, EBC family, it's important we stay connected in this time. Yes, though we cannot meet physically, uh, this is something that I feel I miss very much and, I've, and I believe that a lot of us also miss very much, is to meet physically and to be connected. But nevertheless, we still can connect virtually, just like what we can do uh, right now online and in different ways. So let us not neglect doing that. Let's stay connected. He said, encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. What is this day drawing near? Well, it speaks of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that what we are seeing around us, what is happening, is one of those signs of His coming. He's coming back for us. So for us as believers, we have this hope of His coming. We are not just heading nowhere. He's giving us this, what we call the blessed hope. He's coming back for us. And the day will come when all evil and all darkness will be put aside and He will set up His kingdom and His coming is near. So let us encourage one another. Now this month of August, we're going to have a special Sunday. Uh, 29th of August, this next Sunday. Um, the past year and uh, most of, the, I mean, almost eight months already of this year, we are meeting uh, online. And uh, for us in EBC, we are, you know, uh, doing live streaming, recording, but this uh, 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 Sunday on the 29th, we're going to have something special. We are going to do Zoom. We're going to come on Zoom. So we're going to have a special time. It's EBC Family Sunday. And we will share what God has been doing 
uh, through different ones of us and through our church community care and uh, I will also bring a special word uh, to encourage all of us so next Sunday let's come together uh, 29 of August we will have a time to share to connect and uh, even though it is online in on zoom I believe we are going to have a great time so I see you there bye Hey, good morning church. Welcome to the service and welcome to the word this morning. Now this morning I want to bring a word and it's called How to Prepare for Life After Death and I'm reading from Luke 16 verse 19 to 31. Now it says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in his flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember in your lifetime you receive your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. And now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot nor can those who from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, and he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Church, let's pray. Father, even as we come into this word, that Lord, you, through your Son Jesus, brought to us more than 2,000 years ago. And Father, I pray that your word will pierce into our hearts, and Lord, do a work in our hearts. Lord, if our hearts are not right with you, Lord, let it be made right by your word. In your name I pray. Amen. Now, as we look at this passage, you know, it's interesting that it starts out, right, in verse 19 and verse 20, and we see that, you know, there is an account of a rich man and a poor man, right? And if we consider the culture of the day, you know, surely the listeners here who have heard this story and they heard about this rich man, right, who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously each day, and they would have considered that, wow, this guy is blessed by God. He is really, you know, someone that must have walked righteously before God, and therefore God is blessing him, right? Whereas when they look at this certain beggar named Lazarus, they would say that, you know, he's poor, and because he's poor, because he's afflicted, you know, his body was full of sores, his health was not good. Therefore, you know, surely he is a sinful man and God is punishing him for his sin, right? But the reality is, you know, it's a total different roles that Jesus assigned to them, right? As we go on and we read on, we see that it was the beggar Lazarus that was carried by the angels to the place of honor in heaven, you know, at the bosom of Abraham, right? Whereas it was the rich man who died and went to Hades and was tormented, you know, and was, you know, stuck in Hades, right? So as we consider this then, you know, firstly, 
I think it's a wake up call to us, right? Because you know, in this time that we live in, you know, we can so easily fall into this trap of thinking as well, right? That we think that you know, God, if you were to bless me, if I were to have riches, if I were to have wealth, if I were to live comfortably, if I were to wear the best clothes, if I were to feast on the best food every day, if I have no lack for anything. Then surely I'm blessed, and therefore, you know, I will aspire as a believer, you know, and to live righteously, so that you know I may be blessed in such a way, right? Whereas, you know, if we are poor, if we are afflicted, if we are, you know, tormented in this life, will we think that you know, God, why is this happening to me? This should not be happening to me, God. Why am I so cursed? Why am I so, you know, ah,、uh, in Bad luck, or you know, in neglected by you, right? We can fall into such a trap, but as we read this passage, you know, we realize that actually it's not like that, right? Jesus is telling us that you know we are not to look at what is going on, our condition in this life,、uh, as the be all and end all. You know, you should not be living your best life. Now, but your best life should be after death, right? After this life, at the end of this life, and as we move on to the next life, you know. And so, knowing that, then we need to consider: all right, if it's not all about this life, you know, if I'm not just thinking about this seventy plus years that I'm here on this earth, then. How should I live? You know, does that change the way that we live? Does that change the way that we think about life? Right? I put it to you that it does. We have to, right? And you know, in this parable, I don't know even that we can call this a parable because Jesus speaks so plainly about this, right? Jesus says that you know, in he speaks to people in parables so that the meaning will be obscured, so that those you know who would hear it if they don't have the heart to seek and to want to understand it, right? Then the meaning will be lost to them, right? But in this case, when Jesus tells this account, you know, he's very clear. There's no use of similitudes in this par in this passage, right? But he speaks very clearly, and to me. That shows that you know it's so important for Jesus in communicating this to the listeners to say that you know what happens to life after death, you know you need to consider it. We need to, you know, really want to know how to prepare for it, right? And in order to prepare for life after death, right? First of all, we need to know that there is a life after death, right? We need to be aware of it, you know, and. Church, back in those days, right? There's this group of thinkers as well, the Sadducees, who were、uh, Hellenistic Jews, those Jews that had been assimilated into the Greek culture already, right? And they began to have this idea that you know, there's no life after death, there's no resurrection, there's only this life, and this is, you know, we live in this life, and then that's it. Right, and so these,、uh, these so-called、uh, members of this group, right? They will come to Jesus from time to time, and then they will challenge Jesus, questioning him about resurrection. Right? There's one account that talks about the Sadducees asking Jesus, you know, because there was a custom back in those days whereby if a man、uh, is married and then he passes away, and then is come falls the responsibility to his brother, you know, to、uh, have sexual relations with his wife. To carry on、uh, the lineage of、uh, that deceased、uh, sibling, right? And it says, you know, if there's continuous、uh, passing away of each sibling and so on and so forth, and then we all get to heaven, right? Then whose wife will this、uh, lady be then, right? And of course, Jesus answered them to say that, you know, in heaven, in the resurrection, right? There is no more、uh, marrying and being given in marriage. Already, right? So you know he's giving an answer, and then they were silent, right? And they didn't know what to reply back to him. So there's this group of people even then, right? And there's this group of people now, you know, 
commonly atheists, but more and more prevalently, right? There's this thought that, you know, this life is all that there is and there's nothing after it. And, you know, the scary thing about that is that, you know, if we do not live with that understanding that there is a life after this life, then everything that we do in this life, you know, we may think that it doesn't matter, right? That we can do whatever we want. You know, sure, you know, get rich, do, you know, accumulate wealth. And in the process of accumulating wealth and, you know, getting all that your heart desires, right? It doesn't matter what you do or what you say, you know, whether what you're doing is moral or immoral, you know, it doesn't matter because at the end of this life, if this life is all that there is, then there's nothing for us to give an account for and it has no implication onto what we uh, are to face next, right? But if we know that there is a life after death, then we better be prepared for it. We better not be caught by surprise like the rich man was, right? It says that he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may t dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. The suffering that the rich man was facing. You know, it says that the rich man was tormented, right? And it mentioned, you know, that he, you know, his tongue, we, we can presume from this passage, was parched and, you know, longing for water, and yet there was no water such that, you know, it's so stricken in his torment of lack of water that, you know, even to dip the tip of a finger in water and to put that drop of water onto the tongue is such sweet relief, right, that the man longs for to cool his tongue. Oh, it is so hot. It is so tormented. I don't know, you know, we live in a country that is warm enough already. Sometimes we feel like, oh, it's so hot. And then imagine if you're in your car and then there's no air conditioning and then the, the car gets very hot. I think we feel that such torment already. right? But I can tell you that that is nothing. I would imagine. Uh, thank God that we don't have to experience such torment in this life. But, you know, it is saying that it's such torment that he was not prepared for, right? Of course, making it worse is that he comes from a life of luxury. I'm sure, he, you know, with his wealth, anytime he feels hot, he has servants to come and fan him, right? Anytime he feels thirsty, there's all kinds of cooling drinks that he can choose from. So being in a place of torment then, after the end of his life here on earth, right, was such a unexpected and unwanted experience for him and he cried out, you know, in desperation. But he says, Abraham said in verse 26 that, and besides all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. You know, it when we get to that place at the end of this life and we come into the next life already, it's too late. Once we have ended up at our final destination, it's too late to regret anything already. Right? So in this life, we better make the right decisions, we better do the right things so that we can be in the place that we so desire to be. So church and listeners, if you're not part of the church and if you're listening to this somehow, I want to ask you a question. Do you know where you're going after this life? Do you have any doubts as to where you're going? If you do, I think that's the most important issue that we can answer right now. Right? If you're unsure, then now is the time because now more than any other time, I think, in our lifetime, right? There is a very real danger that at any time within the next two weeks, that might be the end of us already. And if you're telling yourself as you're listening to this, you know, I'm not too sure if two weeks from now I die and, 
you know, I leave this life of mine here behind. What will happen to me? You know, if what we are saying here and, and what we are presenting here to you is false, you know, then it's only the difference of the remaining years of your life, whatever it may be. You know, but if it is true that there is an afterlife, if there is a life after death and there is a separation from us to go to heaven or hell, depending on our decision and our actions in this life, then we better get ourselves in line so that we can go to where we want to be because eternity is a long time. Right? The Bible tells us that our life here on earth is just like a mist, like a vapor in the morning. You know, and there one moment and gone the next. Right? But if we think about eternity, it's a long, long time. There is no end. So imagine, put yourself in the shoes of the rich man in torment. You know, if you are in torment and you know that there is an end to torment, it's not so bad, right? But if you are in torment and you know that your torment is everlasting, I think that is just unimaginable to me. And I don't think that anyone would ever want to be in such a position. So, you know, let's not sleep on this. Let's not, you know, be so caught up in all the other things going on around us that we don't for a second stop to think that where am I going after this life? I think that's a question that we must answer. And as you go on and as you listen, right, I hope that you know God's word will come into your heart if it hasn't already and that it will speak to you and minister to you and persuade you that He is the only way and He is where, He is who you want to be with after this life. Now, moving on, we go on and we see that, you know, the rich man, he lived in luxury. Right now, what's so wrong about being rich, right? If you're listening to this word and you are, you know, reasonably well off. Perhaps you don't even consider yourself rich, but you lack in nothing, right? I think that's pretty good in our time that we're living in at this point in time, where there's so many people who are desperately needing, you know, money, food, uh, work, right? Having enough, having more than enough, that puts us in a position where we can reasonably consider ourselves as rich already. But what's so wrong? Right? Firstly, we see that, you know, he was rich, he had more than enough, and yet there was this poor man, this afflicted man, right at his doorstep. And, you know, not just that he came on one day, right? Let's, let's, Let's get a clear picture of what was going on. It's not that the man was, you know, came and knocked on his door one day and then the next day he was gone. But the implication is that, you know, people probably had carried him to the rich man's doorstep thinking that, you know, by being in that place of such a rich man, you know, being there, he was able to live off the rich man and at least have some comfort from his poverty and of his affliction. But no, oh, you know, the rich man, day in, day out, he was looking at the poor man, this beggar, suffering, and to him, it just made no difference in his life whatsoever. We see that, you know, even the dogs ministered to the man, the poor man, Lazarus, more than the rich man, right? And this tells us that somehow wealth has a way of desensitizing us to the realities of this world, right? If you are rich, if you are wealthy, right? More often than not, you can be in your bubble, 
whereby you know you wake up each morning and then you you eat what you want, you go, you know, where you want to go, uh, based on your own time. Sometimes you don't even need to be, you know, at a certain place at a certain time, right? It's all dictated by you. So everything is up to you and we get so comfortable and so at ease that, you know, when we encounter someone who is poor, who is sick, we can easily just, in our hearts, brush it off and say that, ah, if they want to, better themselves, they should work harder. If they want to you know, get uh, healthier, they should eat better. Right? We can have our heart become so callous towards the needs of others you know, in our comfort, in our wealth. Right? To me, looking at this rich man, this is exactly what happened to, it, to him. Right, that he was so wealthy and he was so comfortable and he was everything that he wanted such that he didn't even give a second thought to this man who was suffering at his doorstep. Right? Whereas, if we look at the poor man who is in need, in desperate need, such that you know, he doesn't have things to eat and his body is full of sores, it will be so painful and so uncomfortable, you know, every waking moment will be suffering for him, right? And even the dogs licking on the sauce will bring some relief to him. It's so terrible. But in that lack, in that suffering, you know, I believe that that shows him the desperation of his situation, right? And in that desperation, what else can one do but cry out to God and say, God, help me, because no one else is helping me. No one else can do anything for me. Right? And the reality is that all of us here on earth are in the condition of the poor man. Right? If we read in Revelation, you know, and it talks about even the churches, Right of the day, and they say that oh, you know, we are, we are so good and so on. Whereas you know, God is telling them that you know, look at yourself. In reality, you are blind. You are you are naked. You know, cry out to me so that I can, you know, give you sight that I can clothe you, right? And so the true state that we are in as humanity, as people, is that you know we are poor. We are you know, hungry. We are afflicted. And we need God. And only God can meet our needs in the real way, in the full way, in the way that truly solves the situation. Right? And so the rich man being in his poverty easily and readily recognizes that, right? And in his affliction, I believe he cried out to God and in crying out to God, the Bible tells us that, you know, those who seek me, I will answer. Those who cry out to me, you know, I will answer to them. So in his affliction, the poor man cried out to God and God answered him and he knew God and God knew him. Whereas for the rich man, in his spiritual poverty, in his spiritual affliction, in his, you know, in his spiritual lack, right, all of this was masked and covered up and you know, numb by the wealth that he had, such that you know, in living this life of wealth, totally desensitized and it totally masks the true needs in him spiritually for God. Right? That he lived his life in such a way that he thought that, you know, I have it all already. I don't need anything else. And so when he came to the end of this life, then he realized that actually, you know, I was lacking all along, but it was too late already you know and it goes on to as we see that you know the rich man cries out 
to Abraham and he says that, please, you know, even if my fate is sealed already, and please send Lazarus to minister and to, um, you know, bring his testimony to my brethren. But it's, you know, Abraham said, it's not for him to do that work, right? But before we get into that, you know, I want to point out to you Luke 16, 9, it says, you know, make friends for yourself but an righteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Right? Some of you may be thinking that, okay, what should I do then? Right? I have means, I have wealth. So what should I do with it if it's something that is so numbing of me, you know, to the reality of my needs towards God? Then what should I do with this? You know, earlier on in the passage, Jesus tells the story of the the shrewd manager, right? Who, you know, knowing that he was in a position where you know his role and responsibilities and the resources that he had at his disposal is going to be taken away already very soon, right? So Jesus said that. He was wise in that he took all of these temporal things and he exchanged it for something that could last him beyond his role, beyond his employment. And in this parable, we see that it's actually talking about our life here and the afterlife, right? That what we have in this life, let us, you know, not just say that, ah, oh, this is evil and I cast it aside, but since we have it, you know, let us use it to gain something that is eternal, right? Use the temporal things that we have in our possession to gain what is everlasting. So, you know, in Luke chapter 16, in the part where Abraham says to the rich man, you know, remember in your lifetime that you receive your good things and likewise Lazarus' evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. You know, let us take the good things that we have and let us search for people who are tormented in this life so that we may bring comfort to them, that we may use this blessing, that may other, that we use this wealth that may otherwise be a curse unto us such that you know it numbs us from the reality of our need for God, of our spiritual poverty, and that only God can fill. Right? Let us take this wealth and not use it to try to sate that need, that emptiness in us, but let us use it then to meet the needs of those who are tormented, such that they may experience this wealth from us, knowing that you know, there is a God that cares for them, there is a God that loves them and provides for their need. Right? At the end of Matthew, you know, when Jesus talks about the judgment, he says that you know, at the end of time, the Son of Man will sit in judgment onto all people and he will separate the righteous from the unrighteous, the sheep from the goats. Right? And how that distinction will be made is that you know the righteous will come before him and then Jesus will say to them, When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was you know naked, you clothed me. You know, when I was in prison, you visited me. Right? And then the righteous will say to him, You know, when did we ever do these things to you? And he will say to them, you know, for each of these things that you did for those who were hungry, who were naked, who were in prison, so you know you did for me. Right? And for those that he would cast out, that he reject as unrighteous, and they would say that, you know, haven't we done all these things in your name? Haven't we done righteous deeds? Right? But Jesus would say to them, When I was hungry and you did not feed me. When I was naked, you did not clothe me. You know, when I was in need, you did not meet my need. So, listeners, church, what we have, let us use it 
to bless those people who are in need now, who are in desperate need, especially in this time. Right? So that in doing so, we may convert this unrighteous wealth into something with an everlasting meaning, with an everlasting riches. Right? As we bless those people, you will know that as we enter into the next life, what is it that carries forward for us? Right? It's only the relationships that we have. You know, we see that Lazarus, you know, at the end of his life, he entered into heaven and he was at Abraham's bosom. Right? Imagine, you know, Abraham, this great man, you know, in uh, one of the great fathers of our faith, right? And all the things that he did, amazing things, you know, uh, walking with God, going out from his people into a land that was not his own, just by God calling him, right? Before that, he did not know God, but when God called him, you know, in his obedience, he went out. In faith, he went out, right? And in faith, he went out and he lived in a land that was not his own with a wife, they had no children. And when God promised him a child, you know, that would multiply in his descendants to be like, the stars in the sky, right? And he believed God and, you know, he had that son, Isaac. And when God demanded that son from him, even he did not spare that son, but, you know, he brought the son to the altar and was at the point of, you know, sacrificing his son for God. Imagine, right? Knowing such a person, being in close uh, friendship with such a person, the, the things that we can you know, learn about faith, you know, the, the stories that he can tell you, right? The experience that you can have with such a person, right? It's such a privilege, don't you think? And, you know, knowing that when we go to heaven, you know, there is still work for us to do, right? The Bible tells us that we are like servants and God is a master, right? And when we go into heaven, you know, we also have a part in our master's business, right? He has work for us to do, not just, you know, as hired hands, but as a son in his kingdom, right? That means that we have a possession. That means we have a share. You know, we don't know what that is. But when God calls us into eternity, I believe that God has eternal work for us to do. And so while we are here on earth, you know, through the resources that we have, we can establish relationships, you know, we can establish favor that will carry forward into our eternal life, you know, and that is something that we should be thinking about, right, as we prepare for the next life, not just in the destination that we are going, right, because, you know, knowing that God has sent His Son to die for us and believing in Him and following Him, Right, so this is how we determine our eternal destiny. You know, moving on to point three, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Right? It says, you know, we go on and and we see towards the end of the passage that the rich man has this one final request. Right, this his solution to this problem. It says that you know, I don't want my brethren to be like me. I don't want my brethren to make the same mistake. So surely, right, if someone is risen from the dead and goes to them and testifies to them and tells them about the reality of the afterlife, that there is a heaven and there is a hell, there is a place of comfort and there is a place of torment. Right? Surely if someone is risen from the dead and goes and testifies this to them, then they will be persuaded and they will not suffer the same fate as me. But Abraham says that they have Moses and the prophets. And if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, then they will not even listen to one that rises that is risen from the dead. Right? Now, when he says Moses and the prophets, we know that he's referring to the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, and also, you know, what what the what the Jewish people are known as the Torah, right? And also uh, the prophets, you know, the, the, the prophets that prophesied. And 
what we know is that everything that Moses you know, wrote down, recorded about you know, the creation, about uh, the laws of God, about the journey of the Israelites from slavery into the promised land. What do all these things point us to? It points us to Christ. Right? Even in the very beginning, you know, it says that when uh, Adam and Eve fall into sin and they are cast out of the garden, you know, it's prophesied that you know, of Eve that your offspring will crush the head of the serpent under his heel. You know, it alludes to a coming saviour that would redeem us from the evil one and from sin. Right? And as we see you know, the journey of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt to the promised land, you know, we see that Moses is raised up right? and he leads them out of the land of sin and into the land of promise. Again, this is a type, you know, this is a simil similar type of uh, situation where God is alluding to the coming restoration and redemption that is not just temporal, right? Because we see that, you know, as the Jews enter into the promised land, they still fall into a cycle of sin and redemption, sin and redemption. But, you know, God was telling them that there is someone greater than Moses. And he did that by establishing the law, right? Moses brought the law and in bringing the law, you know, the law in and of itself, right, is too high a bar for the Israelites to follow. You know, and it tells it's the law is meant to point them that to Jesus, right? One that is higher than the law, one that is, you know, shows us, because the law is there to show us the iniquity that we have in our hearts, right? That we cannot possibly follow the law. And we must have someone greater, right? To make up the difference between where the law says that we should be and where we actually are. You know, and back in those days, it was a high priest's role to make up that difference in each year to atone for the sins of the people by way of sacrifice, right? But, you know, there will come a time where there will be the greatest sacrifice of all. He will be the high priest himself, the great high priest that will step onto the altar himself and to die for our sins once and for all. Right? So in Moses and then furthermore the prophets, you know, and we see that throughout the history of the Jewish people, it was prophesied that there will be one that is coming to redeem and restore and to bring salvation to the people. You know, so the Jews they knew there is a Messiah, there is one coming, you know, who would lead them back to God. There is a Son of David, right? And in Him, you know, He will establish God's kingdom that will last forever. So in you know. When Jesus was teaching this parable at this time and the people are listening, you know, all of these people, all of the, the laws of Moses, uh, the accounts of Moses and the prophets are nothing foreign to them, right? And yet, you know, this was insufficient for so many of them because they were so used to it already, right? That they took it for granted and, you know, is the word was there, you know, and the word was prevalent in the society, and yet they themselves it had not sunk in into their hearts. They had not, you know, made up their mind that I want to know these things, right? And I need to know these things. And I believe that this comes back to the point where, you know, do we recognize that we in and of ourselves are in a spiritually lacking state in a spiritually poor state right because if you are poor if you are in need then that tells you that i need something more right we see that you know these are the people that jesus ministered to those are the people that followed jesus right it's not the people who had great wealth even we see that there was a rich young man who you know seemingly lived his life in a righteous way from a young age Right, came before Jesus and he said, 
Jesus, what does it take to follow you? And Jesus, you know, gave him all the requirements. He said, all these laws I followed even from a young age. But Jesus said, you know, one more thing that you lack and then, you know, put away all your wealth and follow me, right? And that was too big a requirement for him, right? He chose wealth over following Christ. So in the same way, you know, we need to make a decision this morning that are we going to recognize our spiritually poor state and come to God, come and listen to the word of God that points us to Christ, that, you know, know that only Christ can make up the difference between where we are and where we should be. Right? And if we don't, then there's nothing more that can save us. You know, sometimes we, th we think that you know, if only God were to prove himself to me, right, then I will believe. If only God were to do something supernatural, then I will believe. You know, have you considered why is it that the rich man in this story was not named, but the poor man was named Lazarus? Right? Do we know another Lazarus in the Gospels? Isn't he the one that died and Jesus brought back to life again? Right? And the rich man says that Father Abraham, you know, let Lazarus be raised from the dead. And by his testimony, surely my brethren would believe and they would avoid this place of torment. But as Jesus says, you know, and he prophesied, sure enough, even though Lazarus had died and was risen again, rose from the dead by Jesus' command, right? And, you know, I believe, lived to a ripe old age and gave his testimony. Not everyone who heard Lazarus' testimony believed, right? And so that tells us something about the condition of our heart. So listen this morning as you, as you, as you listen to this message. You know, consider that if there is already the Word of God that nowadays is so readily available to us, if we want to know about the life and death of Christ, if we want to know, you know, what's the significance of Jesus dying from on the cross for our sins and then rising again on the third day and ascending into heaven and now awaiting for the time to come back to this earth. Right? If we really want to know about it, then there's nothing that can stop us from doing so. But if we are so comfortable and so used to it and take it so for granted that the Word of God is there but we hardly consider it and we hardly touch it and we hardly even think to apply it to the life that we are living now, then surely we cannot be surprised if we come to the end of this life and we are found lacking, if we are found wanting, right? Because the Word of God is there and if the Word of God cannot convict us, then there's nothing greater than that. So, as we come to the end of this message then, if I were to summarize it, I would say that firstly, you know, we need to know that there is a life after death. After this life, at the end of this life, there is another life and it lasts forever. This life is only 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, and thereabouts. But the life that comes after this is eternal. It's a long time. So we better choose a place that we want to go wisely. Whether we want to be in heaven with God or we want to be in hell away from God. right? And it's a choice that we make either consciously or by default. If we are so caught up in the ways of this world, in the things of this world, then we can easily lose sight 
that there is a life after this and we may end up in a place that we do not want ourselves to end up. Right? And to make it worse, you know, if we are living a life of luxury, if we are living a life of indulgence, if we are living a life that is just full of the things that we want with no lack, with no need, you know, we can be deceived that we are good, we are okay, you know, we are, we are sad. Or we may even think that, wow, God has blessed me, I'm doing so well. But the reality is that we all have need of God. We are all in and of ourselves inadequate. We are all in and of ourselves poor. And if we don't cry out to God, then you know we are afflicted. We are lacking. We don't have anything. Right? But if we cry out to God, then God has a place for us. God has prepared a place for us in close proximity with Him and in close proximity to the ones that He loves. And He desires for us to be a part of of his family. He's calling those. You know, if this morning you're listening to this and your heart is burning and your heart is saying that, you know, there's just something about this message, right, that is calling on me, that is pulling on me, that has this, you know, impact on me, right, then God is calling you. God is saying that you are my child and do not be fooled by the things of this world insulating you from the fact that you need me. So come to me. Come to me, cry out to me and receive me so that you, know, you may walk with me and you may come to me at the end of this life. And finally, you know, for us who are listening to this, right? we should not look for signs and wonders we should not look for you know wow great things to happen to persuade us you know we have the word of god and the word of god points us to christ and christ is enough for us the word of god is enough for us let us not be take it for granted let us not put it aside but let us recognize that this Word of God has such power to save us, such power to change our lives. And let us listen to it. Let us pay heed to it. Because if we don't, then there is nothing else that can save us already. There's nothing else that is on par with that. You know, even someone being risen from the dead, you know, even Christ himself rose from the dead. Right? And the Jews of that time, they would have known that Christ has risen from the dead. Right? And yet, those who believe, who truly believe, you know, were not all of them. Right? Some of them were still in doubt. But those that continued to walk in the ways of God, that came together in the body of believers, read the word of God, read the teachings of Christ, you know, they were disciples and they were equipped for the work you know in preparation to call those people right to the next life a church you may be listening to this and you may be saying that okay you know i know this right i know that there is an afterlife i've made my decision to follow christ you know i recognize that i have spiritual lack and you know i need god to meet that spiritual needs i read the word of god so what then Church, let us know that there are people who don't know these facts, that don't know of this message. Right? And church, let us, now is a time, it's an urgent time that we need to make those people know that there is a life after death and that Christ is the only way that will lead us into heaven. So church, even as we consider this message as close in prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning, even as we get into your word, even as we hear this message about the lack that we have, 
about the need that we have for you. And Lord, even as we come before you, for those of us who are so comfortable in our wealth, in our material possessions, that Lord, remind us that Lord, there are those that are in need, and Lord, for us to take what we have and to use it for an everlasting purpose, Lord. And Father, I pray for those who are listening now who do not know you, but you are calling them this morning as they are listening to this. Lord, I pray that even now that you make a way for them where there was no way before. Now, if you're listening to this and you say, yes, I want to respond because I want to know for sure that I'm not entering into an eternal life of torment, but I want to enter into that eternal life with God, and I want to know God, I want to know more about God. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord God, I admit that I am spiritually poor, that I have fallen short of the requirements that you have set, that I am a sinful person and there is no way that I can be righteous, there's no way that I can do what's right apart from you. So Lord God, I call upon you to come and make yourself known to me, to come into my life and begin to walk with me. And I surrender myself to walk with you, to follow you, to listen to your word and to walk in your ways. Though I don't know much about what that's all about, but Lord God, you bring those people alongside me to help me and to teach me so that I may walk in a way that is pleasing to you and that will bring me into an eternal salvation with you. In Jesus' name, Amen. So if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to encourage you to reach out to us. You know, we want to be a part of your journey to know more about God. You know, just as we all have been in that place before where we've started out our journey with God and we walk with God, you know, I want to tell you that there is nothing better in this life than walking with God and knowing that you know, our place in heaven is secure because we are a part of His family. So with that, I invite you to come and to get to know more about God with us. And for those who are part of the family, we bless you and hope that you stay safe in this difficult time. Amen.
Hallelujah.